The UCI World Tour continues and after the cobblestones of Flanders we move east to the Netherlands as the cycling world begins to turn its attention to the Ardennes. Liège and Flesch well on just days away. Today though sees the youngest of the Spring Classics contested, the Amstel Gold Race. This event blends an attractive hybrid of styles, one to suit those who can do a little bit of everything. Not flat enough for the pure sprinters, not as steep as the pure climbers might wish, but this is the 48th Amstel Gold Race. Plenty of big favourites around for this one. The Moser family have been in and about. Thomas Vauclair always lights up a race when he can. And of course, it's Pérez Sagan that everybody's watching. Enrico Gasparotto won this 12 months ago. He's not had the greatest build-up this week, but he'll be well supported by his Astana team. All eyes on Sagan after his wonderful either first or second placings in every classic he's ridden this year. But also Philippe Gilbert on the very same course where he won that very same rainbow jersey looks to repeat the feat today. Damiano Cunigo, former winner of this race in 2008, turned up for business as well, as did the Colombian pairing of Sky of Uran and Enar. Van Ende was Lotto Bellisol's best chance today before they lined up. And Sky having a several pronged attack. And as well as the Colombians, there's also the Norwegian Northern Light, Edvald Boisenhorgen. Local hero for Omega Pharma Quickstep, Nicky Terpstra, his Dutch national champion's jersey. And also lining up in the city of Maastricht this morning was Joaquim Rodriguez. Andy Schleck is riding today, but certainly nobody is expecting too much of him. Lars Bohm in for Blanco. And Nido Quintana, fresh off great form in the Tour of the Basque Country, was also there for Movistar. So once everybody was signed in, we were all ready for the start. One man just missing. That means that there will be 25 teams beginning. And it was about a quarter past ten this morning in the central market square of the beautiful city of Maastricht, where the good and the great of world cycling, the history of this superb sport, saw them get off and underway. Well, the good news is that spring has finally come as well to a company. Touching on 20 degrees today for those 25 teams. 19 of them this year, World Tour teams, plus those five invites as well. It's one of the most anticipated challenges on the Cycling Classic calendar this, the Amstel Gold Race in its 48th edition. That was first one in 1966 by Jean Stablinski, a Frenchman. Only one other French win since then, that was Bernard Hinault in 1981. He, of course, the last man to win it in the rainbow jersey. Philippe Gilbert of Belgium, hoping to replicate that feat today. Well, Maastricht, just around 10 kilometres away from the finish line where we speak to you from right now. Just along the road, there's Bert van Marwijk, the uh, former Dutch national team coach in soccer. Just being shown around the course. And once they were out of Maastricht, a ceremonial start finished and the official start was given. It didn't take too long for a breakaway to form, more of which we'll tell you about in just a moment's time. Well, there is that official start. On a redesigned course this year for the Amstel Gold Race, quite a few changes. The finish line has been brought into line with that that we saw at the World Championships last year. And as I said, did not take long for those attacks to begin. Not all of them got away. I can tell you, there is no Francis Desjoux presence in the break as it stands. But there are seven men up the road and they've had rather a large advantage so far. One of the men on the left-hand side of your screen there, Johan van Summeren, attacking with around 12 kilometres gone and he would soon have plenty of company. 2011 Paris-Roubaix winner. Hasn't dealt brilliantly well with the weight of expectation that's been placed on him since. But a chance for Garmin to salvage something from what has been a pretty poor spring campaign so far. Van Summeren and his colleagues a while to get away and then for the break to settle down. Yeah. 
So it did settle down. Seven of those riders are away. I can tell you that they are Astad Loza, Van Overberg, Van Sommeren, Plushin, Sess, Vogondi and De Troyer. Two from the same team, they come from the Accent Jobs 1T team. I am cycling also involved, as you can see, Garmin Shop. Euskal Tele Euskadi, who finally had a couple of good days after a shocking spring so far. And the Top Sport Vlaanderen Balois team, you can always bet on to instigate breakaways and attacks in this part of the world. Kind of euphony involved with Class Cess as well. I can tell you that they did have a gap of up to 11 minutes. It hasn't changed too much as we get out onto the course. A couple of crashes, a couple of nasty moments so far. We've seen riders such as uh, Ben King having to walk up on one of those banks. The climbs are absolutely packed with people, with the good weather helping as well. Seen a couple of falls as well, the likes of Martin Velitz has gone down, Brian Bulgach, Tosh van der Sander. But they've all rejoined the peloton, they're all still riding, so nothing too serious as of yet, thankfully. Well, doing most of the work thus far have been Petter Sagan and Moreno Moser's Cannondale team. Lots of pressure on them today. Interesting to see how the race tactics work out and it plays out throughout the afternoon one of the many climbs that will be taken on today, 34 in total. Confirm Astad Loza, Van Overberg of Euskal Talon Top Sport Vlaanderen. Garmin have Johan van Summeren, the 2011 Paris Roubaix winner. Axa Jobs 1T with Tim de Troyer and Nicolas Vogondi. Krillin Euphony with Klaas Sess. And I am cycling have the Moldova national champion, the ex Katusha man, Alexander Plushin. We've seen the likes of Paterski working on the front alongside Stefano Agostini, who's in his second year as a pro. Could control this. Lars Bohm not far from the front for Blanco as well. They've actually said today that they've named co-leaders. As our breakaway takes on one of the many bits of dangerous bits of road around this area. Well, this is something they've introduced to this race as a test. They've shown some uh, slow-mo shots. Um, so they've got a special camera on, uh, on course today. So. We'll be able to see as the race develops, we'll see some of uh, the replays in slow motion. Canada at the front then, trying to set up and work for Pedro Sagan, who's had such a great start to the season. Sagan, third last year here, hasn't finished outside any of the top two in any of the one-day races he's competed in this season. Right through from the GP Camayora that he won, he was second as well in uh, Stade Bianchi since one in Gent Vevelgem. Of course on Wednesday at Brabant Pale, second in Flanders as well. He has had a magnificent start of the year. He's expected to go on and ride Flesh Wallon as well if he feels that his legs are good here, but he reckons that Liege Baston Liege is too difficult for him. So his programme this year doesn't include the Giro d'Italia. Expecting to take a rest after Wednesday afternoon. And we'll see the Slovakian champion next in California, Tour de Suisse, the Tour de France, and the US Pro Cycling Challenge. He's certainly a marked man today, though. Big, big week for him, as it is for Moreno Moser as well. Just it's easy to forget that he's only in his second year as a pro, the second prong man, and perhaps a reserve option today for Cannondale. Yeah, and what a good reserve uh, to have. He's uh, coming of age, and it was his um, um, Moser senior that um, was here, Francesco Moser, that started this uh, event this morning and was, was uh, enjoying himself in the, the VIP area just opposite. But yeah, there's a bit more uh, speed at the front uh, of this race as they, they, ta you know, they tackle these climbs. And it's also important to, uh, to concentrate and to be at the front. Uh, you can just see Peter winning. Um, I was going to say fresh from uh, a good ride in the, the Basque country, but 
A lot of riders um, found it difficult, you said. Uh, the uh, temperatures here are, are a lot better than they were in the Basque Country in uh, most of the season already, apart from obviously when they, they started in the Tour Down Under and earlier on in the year, the first World Tour event down in Australia and then off to uh, Qatar and Oman. But for a lot of these riders, this is the first time they've had their summer jersey, the summer weight jersey, because a lot of the teams give the kind of winter weight jersey, a thicker jersey, you know, they're obviously the arm warmers, leg warmers. We've seen so many of these races uh, with them all wrapped up. But today, you can just see in the centre uh, the Blanco rider got the zip down. That looks to me like it's the uh, Lars Boom, uh, the former uh, Dutch champion in there. And you know, Blanco have got a bit of pressure. This is one of their home races. And again, they're looking for a sponsor uh, for this uh, team Blanco to continue. If not, They'll be looking for uh, other teams, so a bit of pressure on them today, but everybody's sitting behind the uh, line green of uh, Cannondale, putting two riders towards the frontier. Again, they have got the out-and-out -out favourite, and you did say that uh, Peter Sagan, not outside the, uh, the top two in a lot of these major events, and um, he has made a few mistakes. You've got to remember, he's still young. He's made a few mistakes. He's 23. Yeah. 23 years of age. And it's amazing. Absolutely, yeah, he's got a good 10 years ahead of him, and OK, he hasn't won everything, uh, and he comes into most of these uh, these classics as one of the favourites, and you know he ha he was beaten hands down in, in Flanders by um, by uh, Cancellara, who isn't in this uh, race today. He concentrates on the, the cobble classics. This is a, a bit different race, but it's all about concentration and uh, keeping and keeping you know in the top ten rather than the top twenty or thirty. You really have to be right near the front in this, and very important early on to eat because um, these, ra these hills come thick and fast afterwards, the bunch string out, they come back, and you, you forget about you know, the uh, nutrition you need for this, this event. 251.8 kilometers, a long way. It's gonna be over six hours in the saddle, and it's very important to get the nourishment down, as you can see, Van Sommeren just chewing in one of these bars at the moment. Oh, interesting you mentioned the route. It's long, complicated, and nervous, all round difficult, really. Starting in the city of Maastricht, heading out into this same Limburg region where the World Championships were held last September. Right from the off, classified climbs to take on, 34 of them in total, at two more than the 2012 edition, and they include four passages of the famous Kohlberg climb, the top of which the race used to finish, and we've already had a bit of a smash further down the peloton. Oh dear, oh dear. It's, it's cross-country stuff at the minute. Normally you see this in the winter in cyclocross, yeah, it looks as if a lot of pushing and shoving. This looks to me as it's happened a bit nearer the front. Uh, Ten Dam is down there, one of the I am. You've got uh, Gilbert, Gilbert, the world champion, one of the favourites down. I think a bit tangled up, but it looks as if Ten Dam. This, to me, has happened near the front with so much uh, difficulty in pushing and shoving. Well, he's one of the men that they usually sit on the front, and an another indicator that it is at the front as well is the fact that Philippe Gilbert has gone down. And yet Rui Costa, as well, is one of Movistar's main men for today is a lamprey rider down as well as Gilbert is the man that patiently waits for an energy bar. Rainer Honig is the Quillen Euphony man involved. Yeah, the, you just see the experience in Gilbert. It's, he's, not, he's not hurt himself. It's just he's tangled up his bike. He's looking for his spare bike. No real panic. Everybody will know there's been a you know this crash in the peloton. They won't push on. It's just nice and easy. He knows if he panics, he's going to waste a bit of energy trying to get back. But the the most the most uh, person that was uh, damaged there was uh, ten down. But it looks as if everybody will get back safely. So uh, yeah, everybody can breathe a wee bit in the team cars. Simone Stortoni was the Lampier rider involved, and this is what happened then. Look at the front of the bunch. Yeah, right Narrow near the roads, front. Yeah. Ooh, about 30 bike lengths back, not even that, you're right. And that sent people all over the farmland. Not good at all. Plenty of riders, Dad's at least 10, 11, 12 riders off their bikes there. Well, we did say it's about concentration, Robbie, and then this could happen, just a touch of wheels and bang, it goes down. And uh, 10 Dam was one of the first ones, and you can just see the reaction back here. Everybody just taken to the uh, field at the side. And fortunately, the weather is good enough in the... In the uh, the, um, the field is, you know, not cut up as it would be and, and you know, the riders can ride round, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, you don't see this often. You certainly don't. Cyclocross season extended, there you go, a bit of extra time cyclocross for you. As uh, Peter Sagan was almost cut up, just about managed to stay on his bike, if you see, right at the base of that shot. 
And again, around 25, 30 riders having to take the muddy route. One of the Lamprey guys, in fact, over the hedge. Dear, oh dear, oh dear. Oh, we were just talking about the route when that happened. Corberg, of course, has been... It's not the finish now. Just under two kilometres from the finish. And here are the guys who were involved attempting to get back on. Ashley Dozer had Steve Schenel involved, who, uh, after today, will take a holiday. Certainly not an easy way to finish, but Schilbert might have to expend a bit of extra energy, but, again, you would not expect them to push on if the world champion's down in there. No, I don't think anybody does. A lot of people respect Philip Gilbert. He's, um, you know, trying to come back, but he isn't given uh, full gas at the moment. He's, he's just, you know, hanging back, waiting for the uh, the team cars to come past, and he'll slip in behind them. No real panic, uh, because I don't think anybody will be really pushing on. It's uh, Lars Bomb. Uh, we've seen, we know that uh, one of his teammates, Ten Dam, is at the front, and you know, Lars Bomb is. Um, we said they would be taking it easy, but it doesn't look as if he's uh, he's uh, taking it easy in this uh, descent. No etiquette, no respect from Lars Bohm there. He's had it. My yeah. opportunity, he says. You can just see he's, um, he's Philip Gilbert waving the cars by. This is the important part. Getting the cars by, getting in behind the cars and getting up and uh, not uh, wasting a, a lot of energy in doing this. But for me, I can't really understand why Lars Bohm, especially if 10, ten damage down, can't understand why uh, Lars Boom is pushing on. Former champion of the Netherlands, former uh, world champion at cyclocross, but uh, there'll be a lot of riders. You can just see them putting their hand up to their ear and listening to see what damage there is behind. But uh, for me, Lars Boom maybe uh, taking away, what, uh, 30, 40 riders? I don't know. Etiquette-wise, he should be pushing on this uh, hard at the moment. VN Sports coverage of the Amstel Gold Race continues after a quick commercial break. More from the Netherlands on the other side. the news uh, as a result of the crash and it turns out that one rider was taken to hospital and we mentioned also that Thomas Vauclair had abandoned that means unfortunately that it is Vauclair who has been taken to hospital and we'll certainly hope that uh, the injuries that he picked up aren't too serious so Thomas Vauclair abandoned off the hospital after that early crash we saw Moby Star moving on to the front of the peloton Options for them all week, you really feel, with Alejandro Valverde. He's recovered sufficiently from the cold that forced him to miss the Amore Bieta last week. A rider that has to be taken into serious concentration, you feel, here, should he find his form. A couple of pros have been talking to him in the peloton and asking where he feels he is. He felt he was a bit too tired when he got to this stage, the Ardennes week last year. So he's taken it a little bit easier in the build-up and certainly looks like he's a little more fresh. Spaniard was third on this very course in the Wolves last September and he's shown himself to be strong enough again in 2013. There's also Rui Costa we talked about as well. Man who was involved in that crash but he's back in the group and uh, Nairo Quintana perhaps one for a little later on in the week. Um, yeah, no, definitely. He, uh, he'll get some experience of um, you know, the Ardennes Classic, although we're in Limburg today uh, in the Netherlands and, uh, you know, they class this as the, uh, you know, the, the kind of Ardennes week. We've got Flesh on uh, later uh, on Wednesday. Uh, it's um, not as long as the uh, Liège, Baston Liège or Amstel Gold, sitting just about 200 kilometres. But, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's an opportunity for Quintana. He, he showed uh, great form in uh, the Basque country and, and taking that and beating, beating Richie Port finishing second to the world champion Tony Martin in the final time trial so he looks as if he's got some, some good form but uh, Movistar have come with a very very strong team you've mentioned quite a few of them and um, you know Amador, Quintana, Vite, De Costa, Madrazo, Lastras, Valverde, Visconti it's such a strong team and they've come here uh, Valverde has already said to the press that he wants to come here and, and do well in the Ard Ardennes races and uh, you know try and do something today. BMC have got a very very strong team. Cannondale have got a, a team where they've got you know the favourite. One of the riders was just getting dropped to the back of the peloton, so he's done his job. 
uh, which has been very difficult for a lot of them. Um, Sky Pro Cycling have come here. I know that from listening to race radio that uh, Boston Hagen was uh, going back for bottle. So I don't think after Roubaix didn't feel too good. I don't think Boston Hagen is a man uh, that they're looking after today. Maybe a case of uh, Uran or maybe even Sergio Henao, who, who looked uh, very good in, uh, in the Basque Country. But they have got some uh, some good quality riders in there. We know that uh, Kirienka has been on the deck earlier on today. But, uh, yeah, Thursday worked this, and that's why um, tanking there on the right-hand side for Blanco in the black, white and blue. As after that hard effort, it's going back to the car and uh, is taking on some uh, liquids for the rest of the team. Sixty-eight kilometres to go. Five minutes twenty-eight. Now the gap has halved from what it was early on in the day. Climbed above just above eleven minutes. In fact, very very early on once the riders had got away. And at the moment, it's a combination of different teams doing work at the front. Not too much organisation, but it's strung out fairly well, which means that the pace is high. Yeah, they they know that if they, they want to win, especially uh, Katusha, they have got some numbers, and uh, you know we just mentioned the team and. They have got some um, some good riders there, and what they don't want to do is make this Amstel Gold um, too easy. Uh, they don't want too many riders coming to this uh, final loop, uh, the penultimate climb up the Coburg. They want to, you know, possibly have a, a group of about 40 or 50 to try and split it up. They don't want to give uh, Peter Sagan an easy ride. Uh, Cannondale's team in the lime green have disappeared from the front of this race. They have been riding for so long, but uh, now they've kind of dropped into the peloton. Now it's a, a chance of uh, you know looking after Peter Sagan. I think they're just in the middle of the picture there, just there, uh, with uh, Peter Sagan and about three riders round about him. So uh, the likes of Movistar and um, Katusha have Movistar one rider, Katusha two riders towards the front. The rider in the white is uh, Volkanov, the Russian champion. They just want to keep the pressure on. They don't want to, this race to be too easy because it suits their riders for the uh, tempo to be difficult. 58 at the back is Romain Sicard, the uh, French mask rider, who's struggling to keep in contact with the group. You can just look at all these people out on the roads. T-shirt weather today. Might even be barbecue weather for some of them on the site. There's plenty of the sponsor's tipple being drunk as well, we can assure you, across here in the VIP area and out on the course as they're in Kadir in Kir. That's the breakaway with 67 kilometres left. Nicolas de Loza, part of... An Euskaltel team today that does include Igor Anton, Mikel Landis here as well, as are the Izagirre brothers. Remember they had a great start of the season in the Tour Down Under. More points in one day than they had in uh, 2012 altogether, those brothers. But they've yeah, since not been able to back it up. Been difficult for them and uh, they just managed to get through last year. I believe they had to sell one of the team buses to, to keep funding the, uh, the team. and. Yeah, it's, it's a difficult time for them and they took on some foreign riders with their points to, to stay in the World Tour. Uh, that was a big decision for them, of course, because it all goes down to the philosophy of developing riders, the Basque riders, and it's something we've seen with the soccer teams of the region as well. Athletic Bilbao and other teams, as you see Kirienka out on the road for Sky. You can just see the mud in the back of the shorts, or a bit of dust and you know, a couple of wee cuts in his arms. He has been off uh, earlier on today. And uh, you know one of the uh, young riders, Edmondson, towards the back, Lars Boom, who was uh, one of the riders that uh, decided to push on when that crash happened. Doesn't look as if he's going the whole way with a, a skin suit on. He knew that uh, you know he's going to do as much uh, as much work for the team as possible. Uh, and this this rider is a big rider. Uh, this doesn't really suit him. But uh, at the back here, Kirienka. Uh, after his crash, just in front of him, you've got uh, the uh, young rider from Team Sky, and that is um, Josh Edmondson. But yeah, Kirienka, he rode kilometre after kilometre at the front. Um, for, he does that all year, and that's why I was taken on to Team Sky. A very good team rider. So, set to a team like uh, Team Sky for this sort of race. Um, but towards the front of Star rider was in fact the captain. That's uh, Pablo Lastras. So they want to keep the pressure on. They don't. They want to split this race up. They don't want it to become uh, a 20-man or 30-man group sprint because that plays into the hands of Peter Sagan. So yeah, more and more teams coming up towards the front because uh, Cannondale weren't pushing hard enough 
do think the two worried about this breakaway just under five minutes with 65 kilometers to go, especially with uh, so many climbs to come. There's a large bunch and what they want to do is keep the pressure on to uh, whittle it down. Interesting you mentioned Vasily Kiryenka there. I think one of the protagonists of the, one of the best wins of a Grand Tour stage I've won in De Sestria a couple of years ago when he was in his Movi Star days. It was his first season out of the two he spent there. And it happened just a couple of days after uh, poor Xavi Tondo had died at training in Sierra Nevada. And it was a win that they really dedicated to him. Everybody very hurt, upset in the team. The man went out and rode for his dear life. It was a real hard man ride into the mountains in Italy and one that I'm sure will go down in the history of the Movistar team as one of the best. 65 k's to go, four minutes, 51 the gap. You can just see a few of the teams starting to get organized again at the front. We talked about Movistar and Katusha sharing out the work. The Megaforma Quickstep have got three bodies there. Megaforma Quickstep who've had a pretty poor spring, it has to be said. But they've had a chance to win sprints. They haven't always done it. And I know that Mark Cavendish won't have been too happy with uh, a couple of the lead outs he had. You look back to the Skelder Prize when he was really left on his own in the last uh, couple of kilometres. Did the best sprint of the lot, but unfortunately wasn't good enough to get past Marcel Kittel, who'd started around 20 bike lengths in front of him and in, in the end won the stage. They had the bone and bad luck as well. And things not quite going well for Chavanel or Terupstra in the rest of the classics. It, it's just been an offspring, really, for Mega Farmer Quickstep. Yeah, it's not been the perfect. Um you know, start for them. You know, they they are a Belgian team. They they love the uh, big classic races. They want to do well in the classic races. Missing Boonen is a big loss to them, but it just means that um, it kind of opens the door to a, a lot of other riders. And for me, Brabant Spiel did did a few good performances there and something to build on for the uh, for the future. One of the men that has produced uh, one of the most positive aspects of their season before riding today, 1-1-2, Mikhail Kwiatkowski, who we saw in the Tirana Adriatica. He's just up towards the front there, Robbie. Uh, we just seen a, a, a pick of him there. He's just sitting probably, you know, six, seven back. There's a couple of riders round about him. And, uh, you know, he's another rider that could possibly podium in this race. So, yeah. They are looking after him as much as possible, and he could be a, a real outsider. Lars Bohm at the back of the peloton, and after all the work he's put in, whether it be the right ethics or not, doesn't matter. He is spent, I think, for the day now. And Lars Bohm, as you said, might well be climbing off sometime. Waves everybody past, that's enough for him. You can just see he started. Um, it looks like um, all over for Kirienka as well for uh, Team Sky. It just gets harder and harder and, uh, you know, no place to hide and the worst place to be at this moment uh, when uh, Movistar and Katusha are starting to uh, keep the pressure on and this gap is uh, coming down to the seven in front is at the back because, again, we're into this town, it turns left and right and, you know, it's a big elastic band effect and, you know, the effect has to happen and uh, Lars Boom put a bit of pressure on. He did start with overshoes and uh, skin suit on, so, again... In a, a distance race like this, it's not, um, you know, aerodynamics come into play, but uh, at the end of the day, you need something with uh, pockets on to, uh, to store your food because you're going to need a lot of nutrition to get through this uh, distance. So a pre-thought-out plan, as we see Vorganov at the front. He's a Russian champion, Edward Vorganov, number 78 for uh, Katusha team. who have had an up-and-down winter, as we've mentioned many a time through the spring. That's the reason that we're going to see the extra team in the Giro d'Italia next month. There's 23 as opposed to 22 in the Grand Tour. This is Lars Bohm again. He's got his aerodynamics right down to the helmet, which has been a rather new part of fashion that I know we've talked to death about over this spring. But it is another part of the changing fashion in how people approach races. See. The crowd's not just confined to the climbs, people pit stopping the cars and peering over bridges. It's a big, big event in this part of the world. Four minutes 43, and as a result of these accelerations, the likes of Bone being left off. Looks to be a top sport Vlander and Balois rider he's with. They've got a couple of riders today, Sven van Dusselaar and Laurence de Vries, that we haven't seen involved. You're watching BN Sports coverage of the Amstel Gold Race. We'll be back with more right after this.
3 minutes 31 seconds, Asta Laws at the front flicking that right arm, hoping that Van Summelen's going to come through. There's got to be some sort of quick organisation here if they're going to survive for another set of kilometres. Asta Laws of Van Summelen pushing confirmation of the Basque Spaniard. Van Summelen, of course, in Garmin and the Moldova national champion. Riding for I Am Cycling. Look behind from Astad Loza. Plenty of movement behind. In the meantime, Movistar just eased off slightly on the climb. And it's Katusha, their two men at the front. Yeah, this was the opportunity for Gilbert to go back. He knows this climb was, you know, it was a, a good road. He knows there wasn't any real panic. It's not as if it's one of these uh, small roads that there might be a crash, which he was involved with before. And, You've got to remember that um, you know they have race radio. Talking over the race radio, everyone your teammates can hear. So sometimes a, a private conversation with your sports director about how you're feeling and that you don't really want that to go out to the rest of your team if you've been through a bad patch or, or, or something like that. So uh, yeah, just choosing the, the perfect moment to go back when there's no real pressure on uh, this uh, nice wide roads, so we can go back, talk to John Lalang and uh, have a wee chat, have something to eat, and uh, you know, just gather the information that he wants for the last 50 kilometres. Three sky riders at the back. Boston Hagen, Edmondson next to him, and Kirienka just behind. Three minutes 22. The gap continues to fall. Towards this wooded area around uh, Limburg. Well, if you like the race, like how it looks, and you like the touring and competing and having a look around, you can come to Limburg, cycle the route anytime you want. It's all mapped out. And there's also an Amstel Gold Visitor Centre just around the corner in Valkenburg, the historical heartland of this race. Very much similar to the, the Tour of Flanders Museum down in Udenarde, Flanders, Belgium. And on most of these roads, there are plenty of cycle lanes, as you can see. Nice safe setup. And if you want to know, the bicycle has right of way over just about everything in the Netherlands. It is the country with the biggest percentage of cyclists per population in the world. 90 odd percent of Netherlanders cycle a bike. Just looked as if there, Peter Winning for uh, Orica Green Edge was just kind of trying to launch something. He knows that uh, the pressure is on from Movistar. We are on. Uh, Obviously, one of these kind of long climbs and uh, Orica Green Edge. I've, I've, I've ridden well recently over the last few weeks, uh, especially with Simon Gerrans in the uh, Catalonia and the Basque Country, and, and Peter Winning, obviously a Dutch rider in this um, set, this Australian setup, obviously trying to do something. And it puts the pressure on uh, the riders that are going back for bottles. Not often the, the best place to go back for a bottle, and he's hanging on the back and he's carrying a few extra kilos there. and. Sometimes in these situations, uh, if you're really struggling at the back with all the bottles, it's better just to get rid of them and go back to the car again. Miguel Minguez there of El Scaltel. 24-year-old from Bilbao. Relatively new to the professional scene. Vorgonov at the minute at the front for Katusha. Garmin riders we're hearing on the race radio has gone down waiting for a name can't see anything in the picture certainly hope that it's not Van Sumeren out there in the break Argos Shimano coming to the fore again we mentioned Simon Geske who was up there and finished well good news that Van Sumeren isn't the man that's gone down Three minutes six again, another 20 seconds quickly shaved off in the space of two or three kilometers. Yeah, he's trying to get as far into this race as possible. That's the man in front of the blue van summer and so much experience. He still has the, the rider in orange, uh, Astroloza. But uh, for, for Van Summer, and he doesn't want to be brought back now. He wants to try and get into this uh, final, final effort so that uh, you know his team leaders can just sit and uh, follow the wheels because it's so important saving as much energy as possible. and. 
if he's still in front, the uh, penultimate climb up the uh, Coburg, then you know, it puts uh, less pressure on uh, the Garmin Sharp team. So doing a very good team job at the moment. And that's what he was always good at. OK, he popped up with a great one in uh, Paris, Paris-Roubaix a few years ago. And it's just his efforts of being in front. So just trying to keep the pressure on. A very good tactic. I believe it's Eric Van Lanker that's in the car for uh, Garmin Sharp. And, you know, a rider that's uh, done well in this race in, in the past. So, you know, he's a, a rider with great experience. He's just having a wee word with um, Plushkin. Plushkin really struggled in that, uh, that climb just before, so not really um, prepared to help the, the likes of um, Astraloza and uh, Van Summer. 50 kilometres to go and a very interesting development. Orica Green Edge turn on the pace and start to help this chase now. All set up for a good attack today by Simon Gerrans. Michael Albazzini involved as well. They've got Clark, Impey, Matthews, Mayer, Salzburger and Veining. A superb team together for the Aussies. And having uh, sat back and watched all the work being done by Katusha and Movistar. Now with the gap almost at three minutes, Brian. 50 kilometres to go, they've suddenly decided to get involved. Well, sometimes either it gives it away that um, Simon Gerrans is feeling good or the sports director has told the guys to get in the front in order to um, to give the likes of Simon Gerrans a bit of a kick up the backside. Um, so it can work in both ways. So either the sports director has ordered this uh, to the fact that uh, sometimes when your uh, team is riding on the front, it puts a wee bit of pressure on you. It's one of the things that um, Mark Cavendish used to say when he finished a, a stage. I sit behind my team all the stage. They bring back the breakaway and the thing that's on my mind when I sprint, I don't want to let anybody down. So a lot of the sports directors put their team on the front because it puts a wee bit of pressure on their, their team leader to try and, you know, give that back. And, uh, you know, it's a good tactic used by a lot of teams. Not every team, but a lot of teams uh, tend to use that. Just gives the, uh, the team that confidence, riding on the front. It uh, gives the uh, the team leader that wee bit of, um, you know, kick up the backside that he doesn't want to let, let the rest of the team done, down that have done so much work earlier on in that race. So, uh, or Simon Gerrits feels good and he's he's decided that um, you know, they, want to, uh, they want to continue and they want to show well. Well, a couple of the riders pressing their earpieces to their ears, so you might be right that those instructions have been barked through by Lorenzo Lapage who's the man in the car today for them. Backing Simon Gerrans to the hilt then, it seems. The man who won Milan San Remo last season. Spent all spring trying to get himself ready for these uh, Ardennes. Put in the hard kilometres in Catalonia and the Basque Country. Worth remembering as well, he's won a stage in both rages as well. So he's in good form as we see Thomas Decker, who doesn't certainly look to be uh, in any sort of form out of the back. Three minutes, three. Four riders lined up for Orica Greenwich. Skin suits being employed as well by a few of their riders. BMC not far from the front. Again, interesting to see where their tactics lie with Gilbert and Greg Van Avermaet. Van Avermaet must be absolutely tired out after a long sprint. Well, he seems to think he's got, he's held his form right from um, Het Neusblad, right from the, the first kind of classic of the of the year. So, you know, he's happy enough and he can play a major part of this race today in Amstel Gold. Well, if he continues to have stuff left in the tank, then he's going to be important. We saw him really dragging and pulling Gilbert and then Sagan as well. At one of the major climbs in what was the big attack in Brabant to Pale on Wednesday. Flesh Brabanson, as it's also known in French. The Flemish Adel. Exactly. The Brabant region. We have the Wallon arrow on Wednesday, the Flesh Wallon. Better known of the two races. You can just see people really jockeying for position here, Brian. Cannondale all bunching up together. Well, it's uh, good for them. Uh, they have come up towards the front. They have got um, three riders round uh, Peter Sagan, one just behind as well. So they've got four riders left and so many other teams willing to come up and put the, uh, the effort on it. It just means that um, Cannondale and the Lime Green can sit back and you know save their energies if they can for uh, helping uh, Peter Sagan because Peter Sagan, can, he's shown us he can win in a, 
a bunch sprints, or he can win on his own. And uh, you know, this this person is he's he surprised us year after year after year, and he you know he's coming up to to one of these uh, legends in cycling. He's only 23, so um, he's got plenty of years, 10 years in front of him. You just see some of the riders choosing to go on the, the pavement, uh, the sidewalk here, and uh, you know the spectators there, and he, he risks that. And them jumping over and getting caught out. So um, not always the, the best to jump on. It's always like, easier to stay on the roads and races and uh, leave the cycle paths to uh, the spectators. Especially when we've got big no-entry signs around them, like the one we saw there, the motorbike having to stop as we see Sagan's Cannondale team come to the fort. Yeah, can, they, Cannondale can just sense a bit of nerves in front of the peloton. There's a, you know, riders coming back from the breakaway now. One of the uh, accent jobs riders is, I think, it's Detroit now coming from the front to the back very, very quickly. It's going to slide straight out the back, surely, with that pace. Dear, oh dear. Well, you mentioned Sagan there. Fourteen percent. This is one of the hills that really, really bites. It just goes up to the that inflatable turns right, and it doesn't go downhill straight away. It kind of falls flat, and that's the bit that really, really hurts your legs. Gulpenerberg, 10% average, and as Brian just said, maximum 15%. Only 600 metres long, but already pushing, struggling. Everybody out the saddle, really. Astad Loza should be the best climber in here. Of course, he has Basque blood. And some of now pedalling away. Do you understand why Astor Loza has been up this climb so hard, so difficult, and... Uh, you know, it is only a short climb. This is the steepest part of it, and there's a bit of respite when you go around this corner and turn right. But uh, it's better keeping these two riders with them. They still have just almost three minutes. But this is the how that the, the rest of the race are, are, are battling to get into first. You can just see it kicks up, and any changing of gear or fluffing gears, that um, you know, you can see riders uh, you know walk uh, this climb if they can't get by and. This is why it's so important to keep near the front, and that's why the uh, race is on in a bunch to get good position on this climb. Also important, all these climbs to get good position, but this one in particular, because it isn't so wide, it's so steep, and there's more of a chance of uh, slipping a gear or uh, somebody having a mechanical. And when that happens, you just have to stop. Well, the peloton are following. Look how far it's strung out now. We're going to see, as Brian said, all of that jockeying for position here. Everybody who is anybody needs to be close to the front now. Second and final passage of the Gulpurberg. From there, we'll head on to the Kreuzberg, which is 800 metres long again, an average of 7.5%. Asa Bosweg will come over that. The Fromberg, Kotenberg, which is the steepest of roads in the Netherlands. I'll tell you what, Robbie, Cannondale. Cannondale doing a very, very good job here. They've been sat back uh, for the last uh, you know, 20, 30 kilometres, letting the other teams do it. Coming up at the right time here, they want to put Peter Sagan in the best possible place coming into uh, this next climb. It's just not the climb, because you've got this climb, your legs are absolutely bursting, and you go round the top. And this is what we're talking oh. about. You get caught behind a crash like this, anything could happen. A lot of pushing and shoving to get up towards the front, and this is the sort of thing that happens. And it's just as you turn right, and if you're halfway down the bunch, the riders are already going over the top of this climb, and the, you know some other riders are still on the climb, so that's why it's very important to stay Local in front of this race. Local boy, local boy, Rob Reich from Valkenburg is the man struggling to get back on his bike. No wonder he had his hands on his head. He's not one of these men who was a crosser, but he might as well have been looking at that picture. A mega former, or I should say, Ulrika Green Edge man's gone down for Katusha. Yeah, it's Rodriguez. Joaquim Rodriguez. Yeah. Well, any, any, any idea that he might have had has just perhaps gone out the window, and he looks hurt as well as Joaquim Rodriguez. Not good for the Catalan rider. And look at this. These guys will know what's happening. Canada have no choice but to pull everybody. They can't slow down on the climb here. No, they won't slow down. The race is on. But inside the last 50 kilometres, that's just part and parcel of a racing incident. You know, there's question marks over the uh, the crash before when the race wasn't really on, but now the race is on. It's not going to ease off. I was just looking at the numbers. I saw 75, and that has his, his number. So, uh, yeah, Rodriguez looks as if he's, he's not going to chase and try and get back on. He looks as if he hurt himself. And he the reason one of the reasons why I can't see him finish is he looks as if he has hurt himself. This race wasn't a target for him. It's more important to uh, recover for the likes of Fleshburn and Lee's best on Liege. 
Apuritos. And he won't be cigar smoking away tonight. VN Sports coverage of the Amstel Gold Race continues after a quick commercial break. More from the Netherlands on the other side. Certainly the selection, you can see Peloton really, really reducing. Selections being made, and here we go, the list of hills to come. Asa Bosvek is uh, the one that Asta Loza has moved on to. Just over a kilometre long, 8.1% average gradient, and look at that, maximum of 16%. Yeah, the bunch are on a, quite a fast uh, descent and uh, you know, they've got a left and a right back onto this climb and just seeing, I think it was the uh, Lithgard um, of uh, Vacon Soleil wanted to kind of push on on the, on the descent of this climb but the Astrolos are doing a, a very good job of staying out in front here. He's still got 2 minutes and 38 seconds inside the last uh, 40 kilometres, 25 miles but he must be so tired. These riders, or oh, the original seven-man breakaway, in fact, uh, Van Summeren went after 12 kilometres. So you can just see, this is a steeper part, just up towards the, the top of this climb now. He's going to go over the top with uh, just under two minutes, but it's coming down very, very quickly now. As you say, under two minutes and under 40 kilometres. 39 to go, one minute 50 for Mikel Astarlosa. Plushin and Van Summeren, who were formerly breakaway companions of his, slipping all the way back to the peloton almost now. And look at the pain on the face of Van Summeren. It is a hard, hard day. <laughs> 28 seconds between Asta Lowe's and those two men. This is what's happening in the peloton. All of the main contenders starting to get themselves in the right position. They now move on to the Azer Bosvik. After that, it'll be the Fromberg and then the Kuttenberg. As I said, just 12 kilometers into which four big selective climbs, certainly at race pace anyway, are packed. And then after that, they've still got four of the bigger climbs still to come. It is an unforgiving race. It's a hard race. So complicated, so difficult to control. We're just approaching the moment where all the emotion, drama and tension is going to be packed now. This is the right-hander. Remember the mental aspect of this race, so important as well. So, so vital to keep concentration. We've been stressing for quite a while. There's Diego Lisi. Now he wants uh, a podium from his next three races. Former double time junior world champion. Is that Peter Vaining? Looks like his style. Yeah, Peter Vaining and uh, Nordauk for uh, Blanco just uh, pushing hard. Bit of surprise for uh, winning because uh, just in that slow motion we saw that uh, Gerens was uh, down towards the back of that uh, main group. But uh, Peter winning obviously showing some good form from the Basque country. Nordog just struggling to go with him. So uh, now we're starting to see some of the uh, protagonists of this race starting to push forward. 37 kilometres, still a long way to go. But uh, the likes of Peter winning doesn't want to just sit back and wait for the likes of uh, the Gilbert v uh, Sagan contest. He wants to try and push out, and obviously that's why they came to the front earlier on. Uh, about 10 kilometres ago, kept the pressure on, because they want to try and split this race up. Well, he's a Dutchman from Harkema, former Rabobank man. He's won the pink jersey on the Giro. The year that Contador last won it before it was stripped and given to Michele Scarponi. Summer again drifting back around 30 seconds behind Asta Laws at the moment. So, the shot we saw of Albazzini and uh, Gerens. Gerens was actually wearing a skin suit. Interesting tactic from him. Again, all that aerodynamic help that he wants. He must be having other people carrying his food for him.
And we're being told now that there are 46 seconds that separate this man and Astad Loso. So drifting back all the time now to the peloton. Johan van Summelen. This is the man out front. At least we had him in motion for a moment. They seem to have one little problem with our motorbike following the peloton. And then a little later the breakaway as well. Great to see so many supporters out there. The Dutch flags, the real moment that Astad Loza broke, the men that were with him. Powerful attack at ascent on the Kreisberg. Took on to the uh, Asia Bosweg on his own and heading towards the Fromberg now. And again, apologies for lack of live images at the moment. We're just being told there is uh, a connection problem at the moment with the motorbike at the front, the one that carries the picture. I never wondered how. Pictures have been back from a race as we thankfully get him back. And this is Peter Veining on his way to try and join him. Veining jumping away in the Orica Green Edge jersey. Again, we talked about the strength of their team today. So many tactical options. And the first card has been played. The local boy, the Dutchman, the former Rabobank rider, now with Orica Green Edge and attempting to try and join Astan Loza. Yeah, we go down this road and uh, we turn right onto the next climb. Uh, Astan Loza is already on it, so uh, this is a kind of long drag, very open and uh, quite lucky that uh, the wind isn't blown across it. Uh, the uh, conditions here for the uh, Amstel Gold Race 2013 are absolutely perfect. The first time that uh, a lot of these riders have had their uh, summer jerseys on and uh, enjoying the temperatures here. So uh, Astro Lowe's are doing the, the ride of the day from the original breakaway of uh, seven riders. Well, once more, this is the moment that uh, the second version of that breakaway was broken. It looked as though for a minute that that summer might be able to follow Astro Lowe's, but he was just too strong for them. Again, the wisdom of the bunch separating there has to be questioned but Astor Loza to be fair to him has continued to ride strongly perhaps he just felt that the others had nothing left to give and were slowing him down it's certainly a busy and big decision to make busy in the sense you've got almost a heck of a lot of things going on in your mind as well well Van Summeren was trying to keep uh, it together earlier on and he was trying to encourage the all the other riders uh, in the uh, kind of second division teams to, to keep the pressure on um, but obviously doesn't have the legs when Astroloza went and Astroloza now on his own Marcus Burkhart leads into the climb for BMC so uh, Gilbert obviously feeling feeling good and uh, you know want to keep the, the pressure on I don't think we're worried 34 kilometres to go for Astroloza is starting to get very very tired now you just see Grimison we're on this claim from Berg, matching 10% and this gap coming down under uh, two minutes. Well, one of the better Luton. hills on which to attack for Veining, you feel. It's not the steepest. Yeah, we saw Luguten down towards the back there, Bekistan champion, and now on the from Berg, he's decided to go after uh, Peter Veining. So Lagutin getting involved as well. Inspect national champion Veining out there. At the minute, they don't seem to be uh, too interested in Lagutin. 1 minute 52 back to the peloton, Burghardt on the front as Brian mentioned and another interesting tactical card for BMC and he's a very very strong classic rider Marcus Burghardt. Lagutin pulling away by the meter. And it's what we said that if it does come back together with quite a long way to go we're going to start to see a lot of these types of attacks with teams putting bodies out there and trying to test the water a little. But that's what they're trying to do. They're, uh, BMC and uh, Cannondale will try to control things. Well, you know, the, a team like uh, Vacon Soleil or um, Orica Green Edge want to try and uh, win this race. They've, they want to try different options. Of course, they can keep one rider back to try and, uh, you know, go with the likes of Sagan and Gilbert and the final time of the Cobar. But they want to have another option, you know, plan B and trying to put riders out in front and, uh, you know, leave the, the chase into the likes of uh, BMC and uh, Cannondale. Now we're into the, uh, you know, the final few climbs and getting close to the final 30 kilometres is so important, but uh, so is uh, having numbers and uh, a lot of the uh, the teams will now be depleted 
Cannondale especially, they've ridden in the front uh, for so long earlier today. So it depends on how many teammates you've got back, you know, left with you. Quick conversation between Plushin and Van Sumeren there. There's a head now towards the Kuttenberg. Quite thin roads out here. Everything's going to have to be stretched out to keep it safe. Something that we should see help the gap go down a little bit further. Here they come. Looks as though Lagutin's attack, by the way, isn't going to last too much. Garmin now putting a man on the front. You're watching BN Sports coverage of the Amstel Gold Race. We'll be back with more right after this. Here is Astan Losa. Here comes the big turn. Yep, straight into the small gear and uh, just wants to try and pedal up this as much as possible. This is one of these climbs that gets steeper and steeper towards the top. And it doesn't as if it goes downhill. It's very, very difficult. You just see they put barriers on it, but uh, at this 32 kilometers ago, this is a brute 1700 meters and uh, no respite at the top. Maximum 22 percent. I must give credit to the superb inner ring cycling block who actually did the research and said that it is the steepest road in the whole of the Netherlands. 22 percent is horrendous. It's up where, in terms of the gradient, with the biggest climbs and the most famous climbs in the world. Of course, yes, it's short, but it's the 30th climb of the day. Let's not forget that. It's hard when there's over 200 kilometers in the legs. You've been up and down all day. You've been concentrating, there's not much energy left, and if there is anything left, it's going to sap it right out of you. Well, if it gets over the top of here, uh, the falls flat at the top for a, a couple of kilometres on a small road, and then we do have a fast descent uh, back in towards the bottom of the Coburg, so it does look as if he'll get onto the Coburg, but uh, again, you can't see him staying out there too long. You just see his body's absolutely aching from uh, the effort he's making. And, uh, you know, this is where the main decisive uh, move normally was made in the, the Amstel Gold. But as we can see from the top left-hand side of our screen, there's still 31 kilometres to go towards the finish. Van Summeren now struggling on these early big gradients, almost pedalling squares here. The effort there, he's overtaken by Veining who reaches him. This is interesting. Just under a minute, I would guess, behind Astan Loza. Benning joining right on the back of the wheel of Plushin, who's kept a little better rhythm. This is a good ride by Peter Veining so far. Long, well, long way to go, yeah. He's inspired because he's a Dutch rider, OK, riding in a, uh, an Australian team. But for me, if he wants to try and win this race, he's been out a wee bit too early, 30 kilometres to go. He's on his own. He, he never dragged anybody with him. Now we're starting to see uh, some riders from Blanco coming up. Uh, Nordog is in there. There's a Stan, I've got uh, a rider cool. in there. So more riders are starting to think, I tell you what, we're not going to wait for uh, the likes of Gilbert and Sagan. We need to put riders in front. Lars Pedernoghag, David Tanner and Andre Grivko. The three riders chasing Peter Venning there. Remember that Peter Venning's Grand Tour win in the Giro d'Italia, the day he took pink. And that was a heroic ride as well. It was a day that they had the sort of Strada Bianchi, the last time they did the stage. Not the first time when it was hellish and radiant, horrible. It was a day in which uh, I think Tom Yelta Slagda had an Oscar for. Venning went on to win the stage. Win it absolutely brilliantly in the pink, and he stayed there for uh, I think it was four, five, six days. It was until Alberto Contador took the pink jersey and then rode it all the way to the finish. Is Astad Loza doing his level best to stay out? 30 well, kilometers credit, to go. Credit to him, he's uh, hanging out there and. Obviously, the rest of these uh, breakaway companions have dropped back, and uh, you know he's hanging out there. He's got some strength left in his legs. This is the man that's made the move uh, a couple of climbs ago. Uh, David Tanner, the, uh, you know an Aussie, riding for a Dutch team, um, doing a, a good job here for uh, for Nordog, the Norwegian team, in the same colours as uh, as Blanco. But this. Last year was the penultimate climb. This is where the race was really on, but we can just still see the still, you know, there's gaps uh, happening, you know, happening at the back of the peloton, but there's still 
50, 60 riders left. Normally, at this stage, there, was, there would probably be about 20, 30 riders. So, as predicted, we're going to see some more riders come to the uh, penultimate climb of the, uh, the Coburg. Well, selection's still being made, just at uh, a different rate, as Brian was saying to last year. Grief glint of Aster Loza as he crowns the climb. Feigning not too far behind him, I can tell you that. Now Plushin has been caught. Grifko pushes Tanner out the right hand side, gets between the two Blanco riders. Lars Petter Nordhag is the man out there in the front. The Blanco rider from Norway, Plushin for the moment will attempt to try and stay with these four. As one of uh, the jury motorbikes goes past them. Great to see the sunshine, I can tell you that. It certainly adds to the positive mood of the racing today. Been waiting for it for so, so long on European roads this way. Another indication of those gaps starting to attack and appear at the back. Ryder Hejdal, the man pulling them on the front. Remember, he was second in this race in 2010. Again, certainly with the change. Doesn't look like one that he'll be attacking. It's Dan Martin, as Brian said. The Garmin leader for this week. One minute 35 to the second group. Twenty-eight kilometers left. The Kuttenberg has been attacked. There are four kilometers remaining. We've got twice up the Korberg, and in between the Gullhammerberg and the Bemelerberg. All climbs that carry significant difficulties of their own. Both length and average gradient all up there in the five, six percent, all around a kilometre long as veining puddles on. Yeah, he's uh, decided to, to wait. Um, he's ploughing along at his own uh, speed and, uh, you know, he wasn't making inroads into Astraloza, but uh, I look behind and uh, the fact that he's taken on some, some nutrition as well. He's seen that uh, riders were coming across and, again, still we mentioned this too early still when he went with uh, just over 30 kilometers to go um, it's probably better that he waits for these riders and uh, you know commits in, in some numbers we go back to the main peloton led by uh, Movistar in the uh, the dark blue but still so many riders and there 50 60 riders still in the main peloton they're going to hit the bottom of the Coburg a lot of riders taking on still nutrition it's a hot day it started off quite cool this morning in Maastricht, but uh, yeah, it's warmed up very, very nicely. 125 back to uh, the second group in the road, and it would be possibly nearer two minutes now to uh, this main peloton. Here we go, attacking. It is Katusha who've launched their latest attack. Remember, Katusha minus Joaquim Rodriguez at the moment. And the man who has had a go for Katusha looks to be Simon Spielak. He's been in great form as well. Absolutely superb. He's been followed quickly. It seems to be that they're uh, bothered about a man of his quality trying to get away at this time. Yeah, they don't want uh, any Katusha riders uh, going there, and it was very um, quickly shot out down near by uh, BMC. Uh, a lot of riders just go looking behind, and uh, normally at this part of the race they'd be thinking of the finish. They know that there's still uh, one lap to go, and uh, obviously two more climbs of the Coburg. So, uh, yeah, a lot of tired bodies. Nobody really wanting to take it on. And again, there's a strong group in front, and again, Spielak again decides that they don't want to hang about, they want to keep the pressure on. Well, first dig was shot down quickly. Interesting to see what happens this time. 27 k's to go, and Simon Spielak, the man who's been performing brilliantly in the Basque Country, gets away strongly. Look behind, the meters grow. This time, it looks as though he hasn't been followed. Well, that's interesting. Very, very interesting. Hejdal's decided to sit on the front for Garmin. And Simon Spilak is on his way. And who had uh, a Romandie title handed down to him a couple of years ago after a very good finish. He was behind Valverde, who then had it taken off him. BN Sports coverage of the Amstel Gold Race continues after a quick commercial break. More from the Netherlands on the other side. Nicolas 
Stan Lawson and attempts to try and get to the Korburg still out there in the lead. Heading in towards the finish line for when uh, the bell will be rung and it will be final lap time. Final lap of a different circuit this time. Out towards the Gelhammerberg, Bemlerberg and then Korburg once more. Fifty-five seconds between Astad Loza and those chasing him. Kunigo is one minute and fifteen behind, so he's well on his way to those uh, five chasing. It's been an explosive attack from the little prince, and there are twenty-two kilometres remaining. He's pushing, as Brian said, a bit of a passenger here, and he's absolutely right. Find those, those time gaps for you. We're hearing on Race Radar that there's 1 minute and 40 seconds now between Astad Loza and the Peloton. Andre Grivko in his Ukraine champion's top. And listen to this. Heading up onto the Korberg. Four climbs to go, including this. Penultimate ascent of this Korberg. And Astad Loza fighting to keep the energy flowing to those legs that have been pedaling like pistons all day and getting enough encouragement to keep doing it. 900 metres long, maximum of 13%, an average of 7%. Remember, the race used to finish here. You see a few flags from the region of La Rioja in the north of Spain out there to greet him. Jose Euskaltelo Euskadi traditionally taking riders from La Rioja, the Basque country, Navarra. But now in its globalised form, despite that, it's been the riders who were formed at the team who performed for them this week. Well, I suspect the spectators, after being uh, drinking Amstel beer all day, will uh, cheer anybody, especially with a, an orange jersey at this uh, moment. Uh, and uh, he's doing a terrific ride. He's going to come through these finishing line with a, a small advantage, I think, possibly about uh, 30 seconds. But the race is on now. We have 20 kilometres to go when we f cross the, the finishing line. And uh, Kunigo is uh, now coming on to the, the Cobar for the penultimate climb. So. He's uh, coming across to this five-man group. I believe that uh, Pelushkin will get dropped in this climb to leave Tana Nordag winning and uh, Grifko. But uh, the race is really on and uh, the bunch are now chasing hard as we see the riders from BMC, Marcus Burkat, just making a big effort to the, at the bottom of the, the Kurberg coming up towards Kunigo. Oh, this is bubbling up to be something very, very exciting indeed. Pelushkin hanging on for dear life at the moment. But Tanner, Grifko, Nordhag and Veining all pushing on. It's the attack further back from Kunigo that's the one that's looked the most They're explosive the for me. the cars out, Robbie. This uh, race has been shut down. Kunigo on the right-hand side. Some more riders pulling over to the right. Gerens is up there for Orica Green Edge. You can see uh, Valverde moving through. This race is going to blow apart. Oh, we're just saying that Kunigo looked great and looked explosive, but look at what's come from behind. Philippe Gilbert, Simon Gerens. Pérez Sagan, Alejandro Volverde, all the big boys are there. Gasparotto as well. Ulises made his way to the front. It's time for the action to begin. Just over a lap to go, and everybody has suddenly appeared in the right place at the right time. Marco Marcato now having a look. Vaco Soleil already ready to light this up. Oh, he just put it in the big ring there. That's the outside chain ring, so obviously feeling very good. He, he had a strong performance in Brabant Spiel. So this is uh, where the uh, the original finish was last year. So we've got uh, just over one kilometre to go to the finishing line, and uh, Marco Mercato have started to light the front of this peloton out. Mercato has gone. Saxomac rider following as well. Kreisinger now goes. Anton now goes for uh, Uskatel, but uh, Kreisinger is a danger. And he has started um, for uh, Saxo Bank. He's starting to cross this gap to uh, to the riders that have just attacked, and the bunch are just kind of sitting there looking who's going to chase. But you know, leave it to BMC, leave it to Cannondale, and uh, they're letting some of these attacks go. Well, this is pretty incredible as they crown the Coburg. Asta Lawson can't be too long now in front. The pace has up significantly. Everybody who's anybody is involved and is there. And these five men in the breakaway are about to have company. Kreuziger, Marco Marcato, 
and I think that may be Caruso, it's with them as well for uh, Katusha, so they're three strong riders and uh, there is a reaction from the uh, front of the peloton, it looks like from uh, Amiga Pharma Quickstep, just uh, bringing back uh, Anton from Muscatel and one of the other riders uh, from Vacon Soleil, so we're into the finishing straight, you can just see uh, Astroloza coming along to her commentary position and uh, again I'm going to say this again, Chapeau, what an excellent effort he's made out from a uh, kilometre 12 with six other breakaway riders coming across the uh, the finishing line, you just see it up in the distance, a long straight line and uh, he's going to make it 19 kilometres to go as he crosses the finishing line, what an effort he's done today. Mikel Astroloza approaching the finish line for what will be the last passage before the race really begins to look the chase is on behind Kreuziger, Caruso and of course uh, with him other quality company in the shape of Marco Marcato, the peloton isn't too far behind and also the riders that got away in the chase the likes of Tanner, Slachter Plushin as well veining there, all chasing on and everything to play for with just over 18 kilometers to go. Astan Loza will cross the line first. Five rider group behind him and the clock is already ticking. Peloton looking good, looking hungry. More attacks look like they're cooking up. Astan have plenty of bodies and shirts already at the front. There they go across the finish line. One final lap to go. The Belgian, Spanish, Flandrian, Dutch flags all fly proudly here at the finish line. A mega former quick step cooking things up. Cannondale don't seem to have too many bodies left at the front now. I count three. Omega former quick step have plenty. Ulrika Greenish still have Gerens in there. And Pedro Sagan is tucked right in the middle of that chasing group of a peloton that is starting to fracture more and more as the kilometres tick by. Yeah, we just watched them past the uh, commentary point we're in at the moment. Uh, a lot of people really struggling in this race. Ray Costa just going through the uh, the finishing line. Yeah, it's just splitting apart. And yeah, we did say this: it's, it's what numbers you've got left at the front. And uh, you know, Cannondale have done a, a terrific effort for uh, Peter Sagan, but. That's the tactic. We knew this was going to happen. We knew that teams were going to go out there and, and attack and attack and attack. They don't want to come to the, the last time up the, uh, the Coburg with Peter Sagan and Philip Gilbert. They know there's going to be a battle to the finishing line between the two. So what they're trying to do is keep on the attack. Rob Rouge still in the race coming through the commentary point at the moment. So uh, chapeau to him. The local rider still in it. Uh, but uh, yeah, difficult time for a lot of riders and they have to go on the front. BMC and Canada, if they want to win this race with all these riders attacking, they have to do something now inside the last 20 kilometers. You're watching BN Sports coverage of the Amstel Gold Race. We'll be back with more right after this. They say Leukemans uh, for uh, Vacon Soleil and uh, Fulsang now making an effort for, uh, for Astana just sitting sit, uh, behind them. So it's all action here in this uh, final lap as we see Dan Martin uh, coming across the finishing line. So when we were thinking uh, Garmin, we're looking at uh, Dan Martin. Dan Martin crossing the finishing line with uh, some dirt, uh, obviously from a crash earlier on today. So count out Dan Martin. Count in just about all the men in this group for the time being, bar Mikel Aston Loza, who must be absolutely spent. The breakaway is over, and this now is the group that is bossing the race. Caruso is there, as is Kurivko. We've seen Kreuziger. A look behind from Peter Veining, who's still up the front. Oh, Peter Wenning coming from the Basque Country and finished, I think it was six overall, showing some good form. OK, he's made a bit of an effort earlier on. For me, Caruso is a big danger. Caruso, when we've seen the, uh, the stage that um, uh, was won by uh, Henao in the uh, Basque Country, and um, Caruso was one of the riders that came from the, the back and joined him just for a moment and uh, I think finished third in that stage a very difficult stage in the Basque country so he's pretty much at home in these uh, short sharp climbs and you just see at the front of the peloton 
nobody really willing to, to chase. Lukeman shake of the head. Uh, Phil Sang takes a drink. This is danger times. 15 kilometres to go. They've got some strong riders in front. Looking very much like some of the predictions that they thought that uh, on this uh, final lap, some of the breakaways would uh, would make it all the way to the finish. Because you just look at the peloton, nobody's willing to chase. Well, how much is left in the legs? I know that there's a lot of belly sole riders who's joined the group here. Certainly tell that by the short sleeves. And Van and is Dert. that Van and there it is. Yellow Van and Dert who spent some time off the bike. A nasty, I think it was an esophagus problem he had in the Basque Country. Yeah, Simon Gerrans is also tucked in behind as well. So uh, That pulls everybody along. Yeah, of course it does. Uh, this is going to come back, uh, BMC bringing this back. But uh, yeah, just a few riders saying, come on, come through to the front, do your, your turn. But this group in front, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven riders now. Not the original break of seven riders, but a new group of seven riders have. What about uh, 20 seconds in the front of this group? And if they work as hard as they can, then, you know, who's going to chase? How many riders have they got left? So, uh, Nordog in the right, Caruso is also there. Grifko is still there in the white coming through to do his turn in the front. Kreisiger, it looks as if uh, we've got uh, Peter Winning not doing his turn and uh, Marcato sitting at the back. Astraloza, the rider of the day, just sitting uh, last man and taking tickets. He's not going to do any work because he has been done all day. Doesn't look with the flick of the elbow of um, Kreuziger that too many of the riders want to commit, commit 100%. Well, there's still a couple of climbs to go here. The Bemelerberg and then the Kohlberg remain. Bemelerberg to come with uh, around 7 to 8 kilometres to go. Kohlberg inside the last couple of kilometres. There are 14 kilometres remaining. And groups one to two, just seven seconds separate them. The race is wide open, but as Brian's been suggesting, those behind in the peloton have to make sure they stay interested here and have to make sure that there's a will to chase. Otherwise, it's going to get very, very dangerous. Another flick of the arm there from Kroziger. Well, the thing Aspen is, are hanging on. The thing is, Robbie, these six riders, OK, Ashra Lois have been out in front, but the six riders in front have to commit. It's in their best interest to commit to, towards the, the finish and, and then battle it out the last time up the Coburg. They've got seven seconds with 13 kilometres to go. It's, it's who's left in the bunch to chase. We know that BMC want to try and do something. We know that uh, Cannondale have got the riders left. We know that uh, Moreno Moser isn't in there. This is a time maybe BMC, if, if an Avermatt is there, maybe should have had someone in this uh, group in front, but uh, it's left to uh, Cannondale and they are depleted in numbers. Well, Moser is dragged out the back, not involved. Remember, he spent a bit of time training at altitude in Tenerife and he said that he was sick during that time as well. So he hasn't quite managed to recapture the form we saw in the early spring from him just yet. And that has left Pérez Sagan somewhat isolated. Sagan way down in this group at the minute. We'll just look, Cannondale over one rider in front and then behind them you've got the teammates of most of the riders that are, uh, you know, got a man in front. So they're not going to do anything. So, uh, yeah, there's no real concerted effort. Cannondale have to do something, but they're not going to bring back these seven riders with one rider. The other riders have to commit, and it's not just a Cannondale have missed out. There's other teams in this uh, main group that have missed out in this uh, front group. Omega Farmers, quick step, don't have any rider in front. You can just see a pink jersey of uh, Lamprey. So many riders missed out. They're looking good, better and better. Don't believe this is seven seconds, maybe a, a slightly more with uh, 12 kilometres to go. They just have to commit 27 seconds now. So it has gone out, as we thought. Nordog at the front for uh, Blanco. Alarm bell should be really ringing. This is a very strong group. And other teams have to come to the front to try and shut this down if they want to win Amstel Gold 2013. 12 kilometres to go, 27 seconds the gap between a very, very good group and the chasing peloton. Depleted numbers for Perez again. BMC hiding at the moment. 27 seconds, and if somebody who is a big name here wants to win this, they have to have teammates up the front. The question is, how many have the big boys got left? 12 kilometres to go, 27 seconds, and suddenly a mega former quick step begin to get interested here. We've seen one Lampre jersey there. Is that Diego Lisi, or has Damiano Cornigo managed to keep his own position following his attack? BMC, surely with Van Avermaet not too far from the front. This, in the meantime, is the big group up the front. Peter Veining is there in the Orica Green Edge top. We can see Roman Kreuziger, Lars Pedder Nordhag, David Tanner, 
and that very dangerous looking man in the Catusha red and white jersey, Giampaolo Caruso of Sicily, Italy. Also present, Andre Grivko from Astana, who have plenty of bodies in the chasing peloton. And by some sort of a miracle, Mikel Astadloza is still in with a shot with 11 kilometers to go. Yeah, he'll just want to hang on as much as possible. He's been out there from kilometer 12, and everybody knows that, and allowing him just to sit there. It's up to the six riders in front, and all six riders, very strong riders. And uh, again, a wee bit of the unknown. For me, the big danger is Caruso for uh, Katusha, already showing some great form. Peter winning, OK, we would have said, being a Dutch rider um, in this race with the form he had in the Basque country, but he went solo for a while, and he, he might be smarting slightly from that, being in his own for so long. Long. But uh, yeah, these six riders, Kreuzig got another um, good good rider in this uh, front group, and it's left to um, Omega Pharma Quick Step um, to do most of the chasing here. 24 seconds because Anton in third place in the arms oh, for yeah. Uskatel isn't going to do anything because he's just sitting there thinking, well, this is a great chance for uh, Astraloza to finish seventh and get some World Tour points for us. Oh, yeah. It certainly is. And uh, even if he does come back together, he's great, fantastically placed to attack on one of the remaining two climbs as well, which is very much his forte, let's not forget. A little steeper they could be, or they should be, for him to have any real impact. But he's in a good position. Gap going down now to just around 24 seconds, but with 10 kilometers remaining, two climbs remaining, still opened up for just about anything to happen here. Looks as though there's some good, good work being done now by Omega Farmer. Quick step on the front of this. To me, it looks less than 24 seconds. He'll wait for the GPS to update. I would say it's just about inside 20. Kreuziger takes his turn on the front, Caruso and Veini. They seem to be the main three men pulling this along here. That as Nordhag comes through, just tell him apart with the, the Norwegian former champion flag and bands on his arms, on that and white and black kit. Great uh, green, yellowy shoes. They won't get lost commuting on the way home, will he? He doesn't need him today, it's been murky all spring, but finally the sun shines out and we have a real race on our hands. Ten kilometres to go in the Amstel Gold Race. The 48th edition of this wonderful event around the province of Limburg. And we have a breakaway that's been formed in the last 10k or so. Now heading on to the Bemelerberg. It's penultimate climb of the day. Bemelerberg and Korberg remain. The Bemelerberg, the second passage of this, 1.2 kilometers as the pace is up by Grifko, and it's 4.1% average. There you go, a maximum of seven. And Grifko's little dig has just helped them on a little. Yeah, Grif Grifko is one of the riders who's obviously uh, with numbers back in the, the peloton behind. They've had to, uh, they've had to go on the attack. He's not going to win it from the riders that he's got left. He doesn't have that sort of finish, but uh, yeah, this gap coming down. Now that Grifko has gone on the attack, then here comes front uh, as well. Nogha as well. Nogha with the later stick. Nine k's to go. Veining's trying to follow. We've seen Asta Loza attempting to be distance off the back, and Nogha, who's been in the counter attack for a good 30 kilometres now, has showed some good strength here. Nordog has found it difficult changing teams to uh, to Blanco. He, he was with uh, Team Sky, a really good rider for Team Sky, and uh, hasn't really done too much this year. But uh, Grifko, after making that attack, has now gone backwards, and we're left with uh, Nordog in the right, Veining the uh, Dutch rider in the left hand side for Orica Green Edge. Kreusker still in there with the yellow stripe. Saxo Tinkoff, and at the back, a big danger in the red. Uh, Katusha have uh, got Caruso in there, so it looks as if. Four riders now left with the uh, bunch behind closing fairly quickly. Mikel Astarloza's day over. He drifts towards the peloton. Grifko broken alongside this man, Marco Marcato, who looked to be a danger. And just look how close the peloton are now. Astarloza already being rejoined by the Omega Farmer quick step. And watch out for Igor Anton here now, because he's well placed. And you'd have to think that he'd have a go from somewhere. Probably on the Korberg. Surely don't think it's hard enough for him to make a real difference then. Certainly with the 1.8 kilometers after it. Well, it does look as if the uh, is closing down here. Grifko by the skin of his teeth coming across. Mercato still distanced. 
can just see the wind coming from the left to the right of our picture so it looks as if all over for Mercato but uh, what an effort there for Grifco coming across attacked at the bottom of the climb got distanced and uh, you know is hanging on five riders now in front of uh, this year's Amstel Gold but the bunch still in, uh, in sight and for me Philip Gilbert is leaving all this to the Cobard like he did in the World Championships last year he's leaving it all to the Cobard it would be good to get a look at that chasing route because I'd love to know where Sagan is here in the meantime it's Haystar the huge frame of the Giro d'Italia winner pedals away and he's going to have a go here. Eight k's to go and the man who was in pink and uh, very pretty in it last May is looking to get away and try and better on his 2010 second place. The Canadian riding away from the peloton already is Rich Marcato and he's on the way to join the five men who are out in front. Well, we did see him make some efforts earlier on and it was, uh, you know, for the likes of uh, Dan Martin, but Dan Martin had a crash today. He's uh, been distanced. It looks as if he's climbed off and uh, when we came through for the penultimate uh, time and, uh, you know, left the Heisenthal to try and salvage something for uh, Garmin Sharp. After, after having Van Summeren in the break all day, they have to try and do something. But back to the front, it's Kreuziger for uh, Saxo Bank. Tinkov have decided to go on the attack and try and go alone. Well, he's a man who is desperate for some individual success. He's had to change his goals as a rider in the last few years. Have to think that the move to Saxo Tinkov is a positive one for him because it takes the pressure off him that was on him at both Liquid Gas, the likes of Nibali were around and Basso, and then in Astana, all the pressure on him in the Giro last year didn't quite make it as a leader. And he's got to look to these sorts of races to get his success now, and he looks very, very strong indeed. Definitely strong rider, and uh, he has distanced the others. He only has a, a slender advantage, and Vining goes through to the front in the green for uh, Orica. Norgard tries, but uh, still no big reaction from the peloton. We see one of the Radio Shack riders trying to come across to Heisadel, but uh, nobody taking control of this race. Some of them still saving that effort for the last time up the cover. A big, big effort being made here by rider Heistar. He's put some real distance between himself and those chasing. We'll see if he can get and bridge the gap, then there'll be a quick chance for a rest. But it looks as though he really has buried himself with this effort here. Kreuziger, in the meantime, continues to look strong. Again, the wind dropping right off. You can see the windmill and the flag barely moving. And they're heading towards the final climb of the day. Caruso decides that they cannot wait any longer here. They have to work hard together. Caruso, veining in second place, and Grivko inside the third place position there. Veining looking behind. What's going on, guys? We need to work hard. Let's go. Yeah, they're committed. They have to, they have to do something. They're fully committed. They've got one rider in front, and uh, they have to commit themselves. And that's what uh, Kreuziger is doing. He's committed himself 100% to win or lose. He's going to give it 100%. You've got him between the Blanco rider of Nordog, but uh, Caruso goes through in the red for uh, Katusha. Grifko hanging in there. Peter winning at the back for Orica Green Edge. But... Uh, there's still not a lot in it. 21 seconds back to the main peloton. There's still some big favourites in there. Long, long way to go in terms of drama and what could happen here. Not too long in terms of distance. Six kilometres, about to come five. Crowds start to build on the side of the road. I can tell you the cheer on the Kohlberg is going to be huge. And then crowd lining the route for the last kilometre and a half or so and plenty. I can tell you there are about 20 bodies deep here at the finish line. There are loads of people about, all ready to welcome whoever is gonna finish first here. Nordhag has been caught. Now a group of four chasing on. And again, they can't afford to hang about. Caruso isn't hanging about. And there goes the counter-attack. Quickly followed by Grifko and Veining. Nordhag hanging on the coattails of that. But with less than five k's to go, 26 seconds between Kreuziger and the peloton with this man right at Heistal joining on those chasing behind. They've just called in the neutral service cab to uh, follow a Kreuziger, so uh, this gap is healthy enough. He's going to need about 40 seconds as we hit the, uh, the Colburn. Still anybody's race. A rider from this uh, bunch can still win this race, but it depends on who's committed and who's got the riders left to bring this man back? We're on to this uh, very fast descent. 
and this takes us all the way to the bottom of the Coburg and then he's only got that between him and victory is it going to be enough we're going to have to wait and see I'll tell you what people who will be delighted with how this race is coming out is the organizers talk about the route change excitement right to the last here and this is looking good for the people out front but not so much so for rider Heystal who shakes his head and looks absolutely tired out well, in the past we've seen the uh, group finishes uh, you know a group of 20 30 riders come to the finish together at the bottom of the Coburg we have some seen individual brilliance and uh, individual wins even off one individually Frank Schleck before that but uh, it's going to take a big big effort for uh, Kreuziger if he still wants to hang on for the win here Ben Hermans for Radio Shack Leopard has put a real dig in he was exceptionally strong in the week in Brabant Chappelle he's carried on that form here in the breakaway on Wednesday and surviving very close to the end now it's the Kohlberg this now is the final climb of the day. Inside, two and a bit kilometers to go. And this is Roman Kreuziger, the race leader, with what we're hearing is around 20 seconds of a gap. Group behind looks tired, looks spent. There looks like there is no will to chase here. Well, and this, this is, is last looking year's good. finish. Kreuziger has got, got this in a bag, but we have got another 1.6 kilometers. Hermans comes through and uh, he's closing on these uh, e these intermediate riders. But where is the group? Where is the main group? Because for me, they're round the corner now. Are. This is going to be touch and go whether Kreuziger managed to hang on towards the finish. Well, the Coburg, the fourth and final passage here on the 48th Amstel Gold Race. 1.2 kilometres at 5.8%. At the moment, it is the rider from the Czech Republic, Roman Kreuziger, leading them up, but he's being chased by a group that is in itself about to be swallowed by a main peloton who is hungry for victory as well. The motorbike's being ushered out the way quickly because here come the main men and here comes Philippe Gilbert. Sagan not far away on the wheel, Gilbert he's gone. Sagan's launching gone. Sagan's his attack. Gone. Sagan cannot go with him. Gilbert looking good, looking strong. Gerens can follow him though, and this could be the main move we're seeing. Philippe Gilbert on the same roads that he won his rainbow jersey on last year. He's quickly passed a spent Caruso and only really has Simon Gerens for company. Or oh, is that Valverde coming up yeah, behind? Yeah, Valverde's coming up in the dark blue, and this is the sort of effort that he done last year in the World Championships. And as you said, the last World Champion that won the Amstel Gold in the World Championships was way back in 1981, and that was a Bernard Hino. But it doesn't look as if he's distanced the riders. Gerens gritting his teeth, so is a Felix Gilbert. Valverde is on Gerens. I don't think it's enough, but he has to keep on going. They have to get Kreuziger back inside the last kilometre. One kilometre to go, Kreuziger looking OK at the moment, has to ride for dear life. Excitement to the end of the Amstel Gold Race, behind him chasing, very hungry, and in the World Champions jersey is Philippe Gilbert. The question is, does he still have time? Valverde at the moment, number 107, on the wheel of Simon Gerrans. This is this little false flat bit now before they head into the end. It's been crowned by Roman Kreuziger. Kreuziger pedalling away, and here comes a counter-attack now. Valverde, who's been sitting, waiting, has finally pounced. The question is, has Gilbert spend his effort, and can these guys work together enough in the last 300 metres to catch Kreuziger? For me, they're in for seconds. Kreuziger's had enough in the tank now to hang on. He's looking round. He has got about 10 seconds. That's it. One kilometre to go now, and uh, Gilbert looks as if he's about to be caught by uh, Valverde. Just eases ever so slightly, joined by Valverde and Gerens. For me, these guys are riding for second and third. Kreuziger looks as if he's got this in the bag. Well inside that last kilometre then. And Roman Kreuziger has a decent distance. Three men chasing behind would have to work together miraculously well. But it's Roman Kreuziger who looks as though he's going to take one of the biggest wins of his career. Kreuziger who's won week long stage races, he's been touted as an ex-big GC thing. But here he has put in a wonderfully timed attack and looks to be darting to the line to a victory.
the man Kreuziger, wearing 171, the leader of Saxo Tinkov, who we hardly talked about today, has put in an attack at an opportune moment and is riding on here in the sunshine for the first time in spring, lifts his arms, and Roman Kreuziger celebrates winning the 48th Amstel Gold Race in superb style. And as Brian said, we are going to have a sprint for second. Gilbert, the first, they've allowed a bunch to catch them, and this is anybody's how much energy is left here. Gilbert, twice winner, leading it out. Sagan, remember, distanced and outside the way, it's not going to be Gilbert, Valverde looking good. And it means between Valverde and Gerens in the other two spots on the podium. But this is the main news, it's Roman Kreuziger, who's won. Roman Kreuziger. Well, they're asking a few questions. Let's see if we're going to hear from him. Easy, he says. There you go. That was his swan Europe saying it was easy. I don't think that was an easy win for him all the way to the end. BN Sports coverage of the Amstel Gold Race continues after a quick commercial break. More from the Netherlands on the other side. And Brian, what a finish. Wonderful finish. I mean, the organizers perhaps took a risk by changing tradition here. Some people not happy with it, but it was exciting right through the fast 100 few metres. Uh, it would be an attacking group, and a group did get away. OK, the rest of them were swallowed up, but I don't think they, they counted in this man staying away. And uh, it's an opportunist that was all or nothing, and he gave it all, and he, he got he got it all. You can just see the sprint for second place now, and uh, Gilbert leading out on the left-hand side. Valverde comes through the middle. Gilbert's legs have gone. Simon Gerrish tries to squeeze, squeeze past, I think, into uh, third place. Kwiatowski was also in there, but uh, we'll just see in the side-on vision. Valverde in the middle in the dark blue for Movistar. For me, Gerens gets um, third place. I think Gilbert was pushed out down to fifth with Kwiatowski in fourth. So, um, yeah, not the uh, perfect ending for the uh, the world champion, Philip Gilbert. Uh, the last time it was won in the world championship jersey was 1981 in Bernardino. But uh, the new person in the Amstel throne is this man here, Kreinziger. Here's the final classification, Roman Kreuziger by 22 seconds ahead of Alejandro Valverde and Simon Gerens of Australia and Orica Greenedge. Valverde and Gerens alongside Gilbert, who just pipped uh, Gianni Mersman it was for a mega form, a quick step in the fifth place. Vening Leukemann's Gasparotto up there again, Caruso and Wegman all in the top ten and all putting in very, very good races indeed. The main prize though goes to the man at the top, Roman Kreuziger of Team Saxo Tinkov and the Czech Republic. Biggest win on the one day circuit for him so far. So in the World Tour, this is how it looks at the moment. Fabian Cantillara, no surprise, has uh, destroyed everybody as far as that's concerned. Peter Sagan and Richie Port, Nairo Quintana, Joaquim Rodriguez, who we saw climb off earlier on today. Silva Chavanel down to sixth after a good start of the year. Greg Van Avermaet's consistency is taken into seventh. Condor Geraint Thomas and Tom Yelta Slagter, who remember cleaned up points down at the Tour Down Under earlier on this year. Third in the Amstel Gold Race. A couple of wins in both Basque Country and Catalonia. Winner of San Remo last year and up there again in a big classic. A very, very good third for Simon Gerrans. And here's the news that will delight Murcian and Spanish fans all around. Alejandro Valverde. He's had his sick periods, he's been on and off this year. He's also tried to taper and tailor down his own assault on spring races, and it's resulted in a very, very good second for him, beating Gerens in the sprint. This is the winner, though. 
the main man on a big day, the warmest day we've had on a bike this spring, this summer. 20 degrees being enjoyed by just about everybody, but nobody will have enjoyed it more than the man at the front who receives his trophy. Francesco Moser and the rest of the presentation party handing out the trophies. And Roman Kreuziger is the winner of the 48th Amstel Gold Race.